Well, hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of the Human Potential Channel. As always, we're exploring the types of mindsets that allow someone to come through difficulty and be successful. And not only do that, but to understand the process in terms that can be shared with others so they can implement, should they be willing to do so, similar processes in their business. So it's not about a particular field, it's about a way of thinking. So I'd like to introduce a, a friend of mine. We are in similar or related fields, come out of a real estate background. Mike, you want to introduce yourself, tell our audience kind of uh, who you are, what you're doing, where you came from, and we'll just kind of naturally talk with one another for a little bit. Sure. So, you know, my name is Michael Kamesha. Um, I'm from the Metro Detroit. I came from Farmington Hills, Michigan. Um, you know, who I am or where I came from, um, you know, I, I I have a deep residential, um, you know, background. I have a law enforcement background. I was a police officer for over 10 years as well. Um, you know, and, and, and so that's, I think, helped me a lot in my, my process, especially on the, uh, in the mortgage and the financial business. And, um, you know, I've had a pretty, a pretty wild journey to get here. I will be honest with you. It's not your typical path. I think that a lot of people take, there were a lot of risks, um, you know, on my journey, there were a lot of, um, unfortunate setbacks and hardships and you know anything that you could truly think of that someone could have thrown like their way while trying to make it you know i really have had that happen to me um you know so and i've i've used it to i think define who i am now and you know who i will be later um i think that i've had so much happen that i've learned a lot you know, through life, uh, whether it's in the you business know, side or it brings a thought to mind here, since on the surface, you'd say law enforcement and mortgage have nothing to do with one another. How would well, you compare those two fields, shall we say, as opposed to one another? I, I always joke that there, there are days when I was a cop that I would say, God, I'd rather be in the mortgage business. And then there were days that I would be in the mortgage business going, God, I wish I was going, I was back being a police officer again. Um, they're very stressful in their own ways. They're very similar, um, I think, in different mental aspects. Uh, what, you know, throughout my career in, in, in mortgages, especially, I found that some of the best or most successful people had a military background. I, I didn't meet too many people that had a law enforcement background like myself getting into this, but military, I ran into more. Um, and I always found that they had success. And so I kind of sat back and, you know, you kind of like want to observe what they're doing. And so I would say that the discipline and the structure, the self-discipline and the structure that we have in law enforcement is very similar to what is needed on the residential side. I think that the stresses, mental stresses are very high, even though they are completely different worlds and completely different stresses. I think the impact on the, on the, on the, on the body and the brain are very similar. Um, I, I, I think that both require a lot of proactive work. And so, you know, those really apply. There was weird as I would think back between my two careers, because I basically have been doing about them both about the same amount of time that they're they're, they're very you know they're, they're very cross i don't know how to you guess to use the word right 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 but they they can cross over with each other quite a bit i've had a lot of law enforcement friends get into mortgages because it was an easier transition as as much as you think with no background you know when i got into mortgages i had zero financial background uh, i was a police officer i went to school for criminal justice at western michigan you know, mortgages was the last thing that I, I never would have thought in a million years. I mean, that was never even a thought in my mind, even growing up or anything. It just happened to be running into the right people at the right time. And and Quicken Loans is where I started. And you being here, and this is where Quicken Loans was like a 3,000 person company, you know, and I was there before they exploded into, you know, who they are today. So I got yeah. a feel. Yeah. You know, it was quite an eye opening experience, but there are a lot of similarities, but they're more mental. You know, it's the mental aspects, that strength that you need, that motivation, that courage, you know, whether it's a really tough call, you know, there's just, there's a so, lot that go, go along. So do you, do you have a specific process 
that you recognize that you use that helps you go through the course of a day, both with short-term executable tactics to match a long-term strategy and then measure along the way so you can recognize whether you're on track or not? Is it something you do consciously? Yeah, I do. I actually do this consciously individually because, you know, I want to know if I'm getting better or worse, right? I, I, I want to know, like, so I set a lot of structures and routines for myself because I want to take a lot of some of, like, a lot of my mean, like, I, I want to devote my brain power to other things. And I so I, I simplify my life and I structure it in a certain way that I can flow through the day. Uh, granted, life does throw, you know, curveballs your way. And you have to be able to adjust and flow. Um, but I feel like that self-discipline, that self-routine, that self-structure that I implement for myself throughout the day is really my biggest benefit. And I think that takes a lot because like in law enforcement, you are proactive. You have to have, you are on your own. You have to have that self-discipline. You have to have that self, you know, routine and structure for yourself. And I think naturally for me, it just helps me because then I can reflect back going, is my structures, routines working? Am I seeing progress in the things that I'm doing? Or do I have to go back and I have to tweak something? And I do, you know, I use certain points in my day to reflect on my day um, to see, you know, on a more micro level, you know, what I can do to make more, different adjustments. I, I always want to become more efficient. I want to, I want to get better at whatever it is. So Efficiency it, is important to me. As you follow your processes, uh, you can put the best system in place in a room by yourself with no other people. The challenge, of course, is once you go out into the world, it's filled with other people that aren't necessarily on your agenda or your plan, and some even hostile to your agenda or your plan, mm -hmm. whether they're misunderstanding or not. So describe what you do in your process so that when uh, something comes up you couldn't have planned for, particularly something that has the appearance of being a catastrophe, how you manage to stay on task. Life. Life got me prepared for this and books and reading. Um, I, you know, it's weird because that's a very, I really like this question because I think it's a, it's a mental maturity. I, I forgot where I read it, but it's about being able to process when, when a catastrophe comes up and you're slow, you know, you're smooth and calm, whatever day you're having, everything's flowing on, on task. Something big comes up. The first thing that I do is not react. Um, because I've learned that you need to process data and you need to process information first. I feel that without reacting first, I need to be able to understand the full picture of what it is the problem is because I'm, my brain immediately wants to switch into solution mode, like mode, like mode. And I can't do that if motions are high and we're flaring and whatever might be coming, I could get a call unexpectedly and everybody's screaming at me, something that every, all, all heck broke loose, right? And, and so I'll, I'll say, hey, take a step back here. Let's regroup. So for me, I, I, when I have catastrophe or chaos come into my life, and it happens often, I, I do stop, pause, truly give myself that, that time to think about the, the situation that's, that's going on, try to collect as much information first before I start making a decision on what needs to be done because I want to know what the problem is and I want to know how to fix it. Uh, that's 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 it we'll we'll address how the problem may be or how it may have came you know to be but first let's get this resolved right away so at the moment when a stress point occurs our bodies fill with chemicals that stress response what have you found works best other than just pausing to draw down those chemicals so that you can get out of an emotional state pause when irritated withdraw from an emotional state let the chemicals in your body sedate or calm down is there something now that you think about it you say oh, sure you know this is what i do so there's a couple of things you know and i've learned this through you know through therapy or through you know a lot of self-help um is breathing tech breathing techniques as as much as we talk about it they really do help i think breathing i'll sit down there and just breathe for a minute. You know, I also may go for a walk, depending on the situation and my time constraints on the problem. I may go work out, you know, whatever I have to do to get myself back into a focused mental state, because the problem's not gone away. 
But I, what I want to be able to do is now be able to process information without the emotional attachment. Because everybody else is going to come after me emotionally, right? But I can't be that way. And I also have found that if you can set the tone like that, everybody else that you're working with, regardless of the problem, will also start to calm down too, which makes the situation no matter how bad it is, much more manageable to work through and to find not just the solution, but the correct solution, not just a quick fix, but the right fix. Have you and, found that when someone attacks you emotionally, hostily, anger, of course, they're frightened. That's why they're behaving that way. Mm -hmm. What Have you found that there's a good way to acknowledge their state without jumping into it to allow them to feel heard and start calming down? Well, you know, and this is where I got, you know, this is where the law enforcement experience comes into place. You know, like I said, we talked about earlier about the different similarities, you know, like we do have hostile situations, obviously in law, law enforcement, I'm not trying to take away from those, but right. you do have a lot of people that are, are in an emotional state, right? And you can't respond like that. So I kind of just apply that back to the way it is on a really hostile call. So for me, what I did is in law enforcement, of course, I had the physical, you know, the appearance and I was able to just kind of with body language and tone of voice, you know, bring down a situation. I always want to deescalate things, right? Well, I don't have that ability sometimes on a, on a phone call. So I always want to let, make sure that they're listened to. I won't interrupt them. I will literally say nothing and just let them talk, especially if they're heated. Don't interrupt. Don't even acknowledge it. Yep. Saying, okay, just let them talk. That, that for me works. I, Cause then they get caught up and then it gets them. I feel like more riled up. And then after I let them speak, I go, okay, I understand. And I respect where you're coming from. I typically try to make a little bit of a very casual joke about the situation. I want them to kind of start calming down. Typically on the other end, the problem that they see is not this chaotic problem. That's the reality. Just in their mind, it is. And I already can identify that. So I'm not trying to add fuel to the fire, but I need them to come. I need to bring them back a little bit. And so I, I, it's about tone of voice. You know, you really, you learn that you just have to respect what they're saying. You're not trying to attack. You may have some questions. And, and I even say, like, listen, I understand that you're very upset right now. You're very emotional. I want to help you. But I have some questions that I have to ask you. I know this is not what you want to do right now, but you have to understand I'm trying to help you. And just simply even saying it in a calm way like that weirdly can really bring people down. I, I naturally just use a lot of the techniques that I've learned over the years in law enforcement to help me de-escalate de very heated situations and, 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 and lending. And they come up often. You know, you may have, you know, I, I, I help run the sales team. I might have a very upset sales team member, you know, over a loan. I might have a client calling me who's really upset. And we deal with high loan amounts. You know, some of these are seven to a hundred million dollar projects and, you know, they're not happy. And sometimes you, you know, those are really tough calls sometimes. And I go into those never emotionally charged. That's one thing that, especially when I have to address, you know, a problem, never emotionally charged. I really, I, I don't care if it takes me an extra minute before I hit dial or whatever it is, but I want to make sure I'm in the right mental state. And then I'll take the call. You know, and then I, I, I just I, I take it very slowly. But at the same time, I'm not a pushover. You have to make sure that there's a mutual respect on this call. You don't want people to speak to you a certain way. It's not appropriate. You know, you don't want to allow that to happen. You, you I, I have had to interject and say to people, listen, I'm trying to help you. But, you know, disrespecting me and throwing all these names at me when I'm I'm the one that are calling to help you. It doesn't exactly, you know, get us off on the right foot here. Like, let's let's. Let's calm our heads, prevail here. I'm, let's 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 find the solution. Stuff like that also helps. You know, I, I just find very simple things. This does not have to be overthought. I think body language, tone of voice, and just the ability to keep cool under pressure, which is not easy, right? That's a lifelong technique that I think that we all were. At least for me, it's been a lifelong you know skill that I've been working on. It's a practice. You know, I can't. It's a practice. It's a it practice. never ends. You never, you never stop practicing ever. No, you don't. You absolutely do not. And it's a skill that you really want to keep sharp. You know, you want to be cognizant of it um, because uh, the more you can do it, the, the I, I've, I've just seen the more success on really, really tough phone calls. 
some ones that even I thought I'm like, Oh, you know, let's, you know, doing the little side of the, Oh boy, here we go. But, you know, having that mentality coming into it, being able to remind me, I will write a note next to me, stay calm. Like I, there's sometimes that I'll go just a little bit further for myself just to keep reminding myself, stay calm, stay calm. And even that little technique sometimes works. But I found by this, these little tricks, these little things that I do, I can take a very intense phone call. And by the end of it, we're all on the same page. And typically we're laughing. I want some laughter in it. So how, and, and, how does and, and lifestyle, your lifestyle, contribute to you being able to practice these skills you've worked on for years effectively? Because if you're if there's something wrong with you physically, if if you're hungover, if you're physically in poor condition, if you're not rested, if you've drank too many pots of coffee, whatever it would be, how does that contribute to you being able when the stress fires to drop down into that better state? Well, you know, this goes back to emotional and that, that maturity, you know, level that we, we, we discuss, you know, for me, I I'm, I'm turning 42 in a couple, couple days now, now that I realize we're getting, we're happy almost closer. birthday. Thank you. You know, and I look back, you know, what I do now versus even 10 years ago, you know, it's, I want to be successful. I want my company to be successful that I'm a part of Cloverleaf, you know, Steve Splane and what he's done and what he's created and giving us the opportunity to help now elevate this with him um, takes a different approach. So if you want something, other excess has to go. I don't really drink. Um, I, I'm not much of a drinker, never really was. Um, so I don't want that to affect the way I do business. You know, um, I have, I take a lot of calls very late, you know, with clients, sometimes up until midnight because they're on the West coast. I don't want that stuff to affect or impede my decision-making because I'm looking at the bigger picture. I'm not trying to be selfish to myself. I have a six-year-old son, you know, he has autism. I, I will tell you that he has been amazing as far as what he's done for me as not just as a, you know, as a parent, but as a human being, what he's done because of the, of the challenges that I've had to face with him and how much that's improved my, my patience and being able to speak to clients and being able to stay calm under pressure. I also work part-time with autistic children as a registered behavioral technician. I got into it because of my son's autism and I wanted to be better for him. And so I, I of course took another challenge, you know, took a thing on, you know, on top of everything else. Uh, but it's opened my eyes and, you know, I don't have my, my clients are, you know, have a lot of challenges and that has had forced me to step up how I react even further. And as a result, again, how it transfers over into my business life and uh, with the company Cloverleaf and our conversations and in the calls that we take again, you know, you, I'm naturally learning to just, it's a progression. You know, it's a progression through different things in my life that have allowed me to keep working on these unique skills that are hard, that are not natural for most people, that you really have to, like, grow. Some are very lucky, but most have to grow these. And you have to be very self-aware of them and really want to get better at these skills. There's a brilliant person named Dr. Joe Dispenza who has spent decades understanding how the human brain works, has scientific studies behind it. And something that's really stuck with me that I believe you just described, he said, brilliant opportunities are often disguised as impossible situations, but where's the door? There's always a door. And so with yeah. your son, as an example right now, there's a guy named Imad Mustik, a brilliant hedge fund trader. He's huge in AI. Uh, he has launched a company that has an open AI platform right now, Stability AI, and he's changing the world. His son, severe autism, scratching walls till his fingers bled when he was two. He couldn't communicate with the world. He shut down his life, took his knowledge of AI, fed all the information about it worldwide into AI to help him find protocols that would work for his son, who now, some 12 or 14 years later, his son is in regular school, happy adjusted kid, still autistic. And that came because the, the doctor said, sorry, nothing we can do for him. 
You're just stuck with it. And he said, no. So brilliant opportunity. And of course, that's transformed his thinking, right? Yeah. As it has yours. So 100%. what specifically have you learned from the training you've had to deal with autistic children? Because if you can deal with an autistic human being, they, they have you can some... pretty much deal with. Yeah, you deal with a lot. I mean, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean, you really can because, you know, they they they're there with their emotional and how they have to control, like how we talk about emotional control. Sometimes they really aren't able to do that. My, my own son included sometimes. Um, that's, that is one of the things that's really helped me to stay calm when people get emotional, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, instead of trying to match, we all, we instantly, when somebody gets emotional, we, we really do. I feel it's, is a natural response. We try to, we, we, we initially kind of trigger to that, right? Try to defend, I think, defend to it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but since, you know, on my set and, and I, we're, we're, we're going to, like, I wanted to learn more about what, how my clients think. Okay, so what their what their mentality is, so that when they're heated when they come to me, just like when I'm with my autistic client, I want to know everything that I can about them to help me when they now are getting into situations that I'm going to have to respond a certain way, but also stay a certain way. You know, there's there's a there's a there's a just a, a soup of different things that I I draw from you know, to help me with this stuff. You know, I never would have thought in a million years that working as an autism specialist, working with children like this would have helped me in my business sense. But I took the opportunity because my men, my mindset, if it's going to help my son, then let's do it. I had no idea. Here I'm thinking you're going to have to go to all this schooling. I already had the, my bachelor's degree and stuff like that. Yeah, I had to go get certified and go through all of this stuff. But I was like, this is amazing. And then seeing how you, with the way you work with, you know, your client and seeing the improvement and changes, like I see with my son, it's just, it's the world, you know? So I find, you know, going back to your original question, what do you do? I don't really drink. I stay fitness. I stay fit, uh, stay fit, uh, active fitnessly. I, I work out in the gym twice a day if I can, you know, here and there, I want to stay healthy. I think that's really important. You need that energy, right? I, I have a lot to do in my day. Um, I, education. I don't think we're ever old. We're, we're never too old to educate. I spend a lot of time in the library because I encourage reading with my son. So when we're in the library, you know, for his children's books, I'm in the library looking for self-improvement books for myself, whether it's for leadership, whether it's for mental growth, spiritual growth, you know, mental maturity. Like I want to find ways to get better. So I do a lot in my daily life. And then as I approach like how I want my life to look for my for my best success. And I, and I, again, I, you know, I change that, you know, as I go, you know, to so tweak as, a, to as a young man, as a, as a teenager, were you always some version of what you've described or was there an evolutionary no. process that took place? No, no. If I were to look back from where I was as, you know, a teenager as where to where I am now, I am, I'm not the same person, not even close. I mean, as far as my heart goes, like my soul, yes. Um, but I've had way too much life that I've had to unfortunately experience that a lot don't. And that changed me into the person I am now. I was not driven, motivated, and inspired. I didn't have this, not necessarily a spiritual or emotional awakening. You know, just one day I've had to have a lot of things occur in my life to give me that drive, that endless drive to never stop, never quit. I can't quit. You know, that's one thing that I, you know, I even have, you know, that, you know, that tattooed on me that, you know, pain is temporary, quitting, la you know, quitting lasts forever. And I, I don't know how to quit. So if I'm focused on something, I don't care if it's a personal goal, a business goal or whatever it is, we're, we're going to, we're going to make it happen. I'm driven. Not, and, and, I, and I think that uh, that expression success is rented and that that rent is due every day. Right. Like if you want that success, you have to earn it every single day. And that takes a whole lot of subcategories that you set yourself up, your, yourself self up for to make sure that that happens. Did you meet a mentor at some point in your life that helped open your eyes? I want to say yes and no. So as weird as I say, I think that my therapist, after my mom passed away, I think really started to help me on that spiritual, that mental, emotional maturity that I obviously that I needed. I think that outside of that, I, I will say that there the other person that's been 
really influential to me from a business standpoint is our owner of the company. And I mean, that's Steve Spillane. Um, I have a very deep respect for him. The more I've learned him and understood him and the way he's kind of taken us under his wing and, and really is guiding us, you know, in the ways and, and, and where I've come professionally as a result of it um, has been incredible. Um, and he's allowed me to, which I think says a lot about him. And that's the type of people that you want to work with and for is the ones that give you the freedom to create, to be you, to listen to you, to not think that you are the end all be all. And he is, but at the end of the day, he allows us to give him the feedback that we all need to, to be successful. Um, I've had, you know, a very great support system in my life, especially after the, like the last six years um, have, that have been, I think, the most difficult. I would feel in my life this has been the hardest period and where it's taken the most mental strength to push through to get to where I'm at today. How do you uh, keep your eyes on your long-term goals? How do you keep yourself from getting distracted and derailed uh, so that you lose where you really wish to move toward? I don't know if it's just naturally who I am or it's because of life that I have this internal fire that I just simply cannot feel like I'm satisfied until it's done. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know if it's a combination of both or one or the other. I don't know if this is just something that I really have. I think that my mom was very much similar to me like this. Mm -hmm. So I know that a lot of this, you know, I, I get from her, she, but, um, I don't know how to, like I said, it goes back to, I don't know how to quit. If I've made my mind up, I'm on something, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to keep going. And even when it, when, when things get the hardest is where you really need to buckle down. That's where the make or break point is, right? You know, where you're going to really, you know, define yourself. Um, and I've been in those situations and, 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 you know, where you're, you have to decide. It's, what do you, do you, what do you want to fail now and turn your back on all of it? Or do you go harder? You have to find that in you. And sometimes that takes a lot of searching. Everybody has a different way. But I have to find what's – my son is a big motivation. Fear of failure is a big one for me. I think that that does motivate me. I don't want to fail. I understand that failing is part of the learning process. And I think it's critical because I have failed plenty in life. And I can tell you that, you know, as a result that I've learned so much from that, but I still have that fear. I don't want to fail. Um, I don't want to let my son down. You know, I, I, I have people that uh, I'm responsible for that are relying on me to give my, you know, them my best. And so I require that and demand that upon myself that I have to be the best person that I can be. And that might be, Today I'm the best, but tomorrow I might learn something more. You, that's why you never stop learning. You never start stop evolving because you haven't really achieved your best just yet, even though you think you have. In fact, you can't really grow without going into uncharted territory where you're yeah. uncertain of what might be the right answer. In fact, it's fair to say that human beings are error correction machines. They keep yes. making mistakes and correcting and making mistakes, just like everyone's buzzing about artificial intelligence, but it does the same thing. It, it corrects, error, correct, mm -hmm. error, correct, error, correct. So how do you know when you made an error? The external world gives you feedback and you say, that's not really what I was looking for. <laughs> I guess I guess I need to do sure. something different. Huh? So what's your, your long-term big lifetime purpose? What really all the parts we've talked about is tied in to be able to push through uh, many things I'm sure you haven't talked about, but the edges of which you've shared with us, what keeps you moving forward and air correcting and not giving up when others may be left behind and do? I want to show my parents that are looking down on me that I made it and that I'm okay and that my son's okay and that I have done everything that they knew that I was meant to be. And so for me, I don't know what that looks like, 
I just know that this is the beginning of a much bigger chapter of my life. And so my big picture is to, I, I don't know. I, I, I want to be able, I, I really, you know, it's so unwritten. I, I want to be able to create something beautiful that has a lasting impression on an industry. I want to be a part of that. I think that on a professional level, that's what I want on a personal level. Um, I, I want the ability to be able to give back. Um, that's a big one for me. Um, you know, one of my end games is that I ultimately want to start a foundation in my mother's honor. It's been a big focus in my life for the last five years. Um, and so I have my path for that. And I know that that's going to take some time. So for me, what I'm doing professionally is to truly fuel my other dreams and hopes that I have for, you know, personally. Um, so I know that one needs to happen before, you know, other things can. So I don't know. I just want to make sure that I, to me, I'd like to make an impact as an officer. I got into it because you wanted to make an impact amongst the community. And sometimes it's challenging, but I feel in this industry and with what I'm doing, whether it's in the autism world or whether it's in the commercial lending world, I feel like I can leave a lasting impression over time. And that's, that's what I'd like to do. So it sounds to me, if we were going to simplify the depth of what we've touched on is, uh, you want to be an example to others in this yeah. industry that we share, you and I, uh, but in life in general, and maybe the foundation in your mother's name uh, to help others help themselves rather than provide them some kind of support network that goes on forever and weakens them. Instead, offer them a learning opportunity to rise to the challenge with proper support and mentoring so they can be the best they can be. And as they do that for others, it becomes a exponential growth of a higher quality world. So we talk about making a living and being successful, but really that's part of the, the ladder that we're climbing on. But what's really important is not how many dollars we end up with, which have value. You can do great things with dollars, but who we help along the way to learn from what we have suffered through so that they can be a better version of themselves. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't from the help and belief of family and friends, you know, and, and what they've been able to sacrifice for me. And I want to be able to one day be able to do that on a much bigger scale. I, I just do, um, you know, and you're right, not to enable, so to speak, but to inspire, to give them an opportunity and a chance, because I feel like everybody, if you give them the right tools can really do something great with themselves, but they need some guidance. And you said mentorship and a way to do it, a path. And, you know, just in the small samples of my life where I've been able to help people and watching their success, you know, where you kind of have to take the training wheels off a little bit and watch them grow with the foundation that you've given them. It's just, there's just something about it to me. There's just, there's just nothing better. It makes my heart smile. I mean, I guess that's the best way to put it. You know, I even see it with my own son and, and some of the stuff that we work on that I'm watching with him right now and in, in allowing him to, to do these things and, or where I'm at the clinic or even with my own, you know, sales guys, you know, taking the training wheels, letting them know you got this. I know you got this building that confidence in themselves is a big part of this, not just helping them, but the confidence part is something that they need just as much, if not more, if not more. And um, that's something that I enjoy. This has been a delightful opportunity to get to know you better. Uh, I'm impressed with what I hear. I understand uh, why you've already been successful. I really, my heart goes out to you uh, with your son and how you've risen to it. I had a, when I was a very young boy, I had a cousin that was born with profound uh, Hurler syndrome, which is a version of Down syndrome. And he didn't live to be maybe nine years old. And there was something about how I learned to relate to him. He and I were very close in ways that people didn't understand that touched my life and still affects me today. So if, if you were to leave the audience with something simple that they can do this minute, right after they listen to this show, to start changing their life in a direction they would find more fulfilling, something simple that would be just as easy not to do, what would you say that is? This is going to sound totally off, 
base or maybe even sound weird. The very first thing that I do when I start my day is make your bed. I know that sounds so weird, but I starting with the very first task of your day that you accomplish. And this is, this is came from an admiral who was addressing Annapolis. And he said, there's a reason why we meet the very first thing that you're taught when you come here is to make your bed. And I know that's that you can think about it metaphorically. You can think about it, you know, in the figure, you know, the literal sense. But I'll tell you right now that when I started doing that years ago, something that you can start doing right away. And I know it sounds weird. Is when you wake up in the morning, the very first thing you do is make your bed and start your day. It doesn't sound weird to me because that's what I do. <laughs> that's exactly I what do, I, I do. I, I, I do. It starts putting yep. the world in order for me to move forward. Uh, there's no chaos in my bed. <laughs> I can pull the, the covers down, the sheets over and tuck them in. There's usually no interruption for that process. And then I have a whole additional routine that I go through after that. I want to thank you for taking the time to share with us what you have. I want to encourage our audience to give us a thumbs up and subscribe. And uh, please uh, share this with your friends, share this with your relatives, and then reach out to us so that we can have additional guests because the point of this show is to pay it forward by sharing the message. Where can somebody get a hold of you if they want to talk to you about the mortgage business or about autism? Um, they can reach out to me directly. I, I'm not sure if I can, you know, plug yeah. in, yeah. Uh, you know, you can, you know, my, my, write in my, my email is Mike dot my last name is spelled k u m is in mary e i s h a at cloverleaflending.com uh, my phone number is 248-249-2800 you can also find me on facebook linkedin social uh, i believe i'm also on tiktok as well um you know i would love to be able to hear you know your stories and thoughts and I would love to be able to reach out and or communicate with more people because uh, whether I can inspire or maybe or I can get inspired, you know, it'd be great to start more conversations, you know, on things for sure. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll send you a, a link to this so you can share awesome. it with others. I'll look forward to doing a follow up with you. I'm sure there's yeah. things that we can do personally and professionally. David, thank you so much for your 